Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Guilds of Ravnica set review. Today we are going to be jumping into the set, looking at the new cards, and evaluating them for limited play. We are going to be starting with white, we're going to go through all of the colors, and then finish up with the multicolored cards, artifacts, and lands. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into the video. But I do want to remind you that if you enjoyed the video, be sure to click that thumbs up and subscribe to get updates for whenever I post new content, or if you want to start seeing the next installments of the series. But let's get into it. Uh, looking at the cards, uh, first of all, I would like to say that if you are drafting or playing sealed in Guilds of Ravnica, there are many, many cards that care about which guild you are in. And if you've never played in a Ravnica before, guilds are basically two color combinations. Um, and before I begin evaluating the cards, I just want to let you know that it is very, very difficult, in my opinion, to play off guild. So keep that in mind when you're evalu evaluating these cards, that you are going to be playing white cards when they are, when they are going to be paired with red or green or some combination of that, because uh, Selesnya and Boros are the guilds that white goes in, and so you are very rarely going to be playing blue-white in this format, uh, at least starting out, that doesn't seem like it's going to be viable, just because there's so many gold cards, and that's how Ravnica works. Um, another little note, uh, with my uh, how I rate cards, um, I don't give a card an official grade, I just talk about the card, and I like to talk about when you should take it in a draft. I think that's far more valuable than giving it a letter grade, because there's a lot of cards that would clump up in the C-plus to B-minus range, or in the C range, so... I'm just going to talk about the cards, and then off to the side, you can see which cards I think are going to be the top five commons uh, off of the bat, if I was picking them pack one, pick one. So without further ado, let's get into them. Uh, if the card's, another thing, if the card's pretty average, I'm just going to say that and move on. Uh, Blade Instructor, three mana, three one with Mentor. Uh, mentor is the new keyword that whenever a creature attacks, you put a plus one, plus one counter on target cre attacking creature with less power. So having three power is pretty nice for this because it can turn your 2-2 two, two that you play on turn two into a 3-3 three, three attacker when you attack with this Blade Instructor. I do think Blade Instructor is going to be fine, but I don't think it's going to be exceptional just because one toughness means it's going to trade with everything. And so your 3-1 is often going to trade down on mana. But I think this is definitely a card you will play in your aggressive decks. You don't really want it as a blocker because it's pretty horrific unless you're using Mentor. So pretty much this is a card that your aggressive deck will want, but you won't don't really need to, you don't need to prioritize it because uh, defensive decks don't want it, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be an all-star. Next up, we have Bounty Agent, which is basically just a 2-mana 2-2 two two Vigilance, which isn't a great card, so you don't need to prioritize this. You can get it maybe later in the draft, and it'll be fine, but I don't think it's going to be insane. Uh, definitely not a card you need to prioritize. Next up, we have Candlelight Vigil. Uh, four mana, your creature gets plus three, plus two in Vigilance. I think this card definitely has a home because there are some mentor creatures that have evasion. There's one with flying. There's an uncommon that has first strike. So if you put Candlelight Vigil onto a mentor creature and make it into a huge threat, you can start buffing up all of your creatures. So I definitely think Candlelight Vigil has a home in aggressive decks with a lot of mentor creatures. So keep that in mind. Outside of that is very expensive and opens you up to getting blown out from removal. So unless you're a super aggressive deck that doesn't mind getting two from one a lot of the time, uh, I think Candlelight Vigil is a card that you can use pretty effectively, So, but I don't think you need to prioritize it. I think you can get it later in the draft because no one else wants it. Next up, we have Citywide Bust, which is a rare that I think is pretty much unplayable. I don't think there's enough creatures with toughness 4 or greater that you're going to be getting a significant advantage out of Citywide Bust. I think you might kill one of your opponent's creatures some of the time, and a lot of the time it's going to be stuck in your hand. So I think I'm going to start off with it being a sideboard card, but most of the time unplayable. Same thing with Collar the Culprit. Destroying a creature with toughness 4 or greater is just really hard because a lot of the creatures in Limited are pretty small. Uh, you can definitely side this in, but the games where you have this in your hand and it just sits there and doesn't do anything, you're going to lose a lot of those games, like when they're hit hitting you with their 3-3 three, three flyer and you can't kill their guy. Even when you do use this spell, it's not particularly efficient. It does cost 4 mana, so I think Caller the Culprit is a sideboard card uh, and not even insane out of the sideboard. Conclave Tribunal, on the other hand, is a very efficient uh, spell, especially because it has Convoke. Uh, it means that your cheap creatures can help you cast this if you play like a card that makes a creature like so say you play a three drop on turn like six you can play the three drop creature and immediately tap it to cast conclave tribunal as well so it helps you with your mana efficiency later in the game maybe you have another couple creatures lying around so you can cast it for only one mana at that point in the game um, exiling any non-land permanent is really good so I'm going to start off by saying conclave tribunal is a card that you can take first and be pretty happy about it I think it's one of the better un it's just a very good uncommon and very strong uh, definitely a card that you want to keep in mind and a pretty nice payoff for Convoke because if you ever cast this for like one mana on turn five or something and just really get an efficient rush, efficient spell uh, casting going, it's really nice to cast it for super cheap. Definitely a card you want to prioritize and take early. Crush Contraband is definitely a sideboard card. It's fine if your opponent has artifacts and enchantments that are going to be good, but uh, I think you definitely want to have the potential to get a two-for-one with this card if you're bringing it in because it is super inefficient. So if you see uh, maybe two good artifacts and two good enchantments, you might bring this in because hitting one, it's kind of bad because it's a one-for-one, one, but it costs you four mana. Uh, but if you ever hit both, then it's really good. And also, if your opponent has a super game-breaking enchantment, then you might want to bring it in because there are a couple of good builder-ed enchantments in this set. 
Uh, next up, we have Dawn of Hope. Uh, it's a rare that's kind of interesting. I don't know how much life gain there's going to be, but it does let you create 1-1 one, one soldier creatures with lifelink uh, on its own. So uh, if the format is a bit slower, then Dawn of Hope is going to be great because making a 1-1 one, one, uh, token for 4 mana that you can repeat. So if you get up to 8 mana, you can start making 2 a turn, and then you can start gaining life with them. So if the format's a bit slower, then Dawn of Hope could be quite good. Uh, mm -hmm. However, if the format is has a quick deck in it, Dawn of Hope could be the type of card that you cast on turn two and then you never get to activate it or use it even once because it is very expensive to use. So keep that in mind. I'm going to start off with the card being kind of bad because I think it is a bit slow and I think that the white decks uh, don't really struggle to go wide as much. They don't really need the token maker, but they do. And some of them, the red-white deck in particular, want to be aggressive because that is what Boros is all about. So I think Dawn of Hope is not going to really have a great home in this set, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to start off with the card being pretty bad. Demotion is a very interesting card. Uh, important to note that the creature can still attack. So if you're behind, this card does absolutely nothing. It's pretty much a card that's built for you racing. So if your opponent plays their big 5-5 five five and you have a bunch of small guys that you're racing him with, you play Demotion on it and you can attack past it. That being said, I think Demotion has a very narrow home. And I think that you're, if your deck is super aggressive, you're going to want it. But if your deck is has the potential to fall behind, Demotion is horrible because if you're behind, it just actually is a blank. So... I think Demotion is a uh, card that aggressive decks will want, maybe, uh, but only if you have like four one drops, six, eight, like eight two drops, like uh, like curve ends at three, that type of aggressive deck that's like always going to have a consistent curve out, which you can't even guarantee in limited. So I don't think Demotion is going to be insane. I think people are going to play it a lot early because I don't. I think they're not going to realize that it doesn't say can't attack, and then they're going to get attacked by the creature, reread the card, and be like, oh man, that's not great. Uh, Divine Visitation. I think this card is pretty good. I actually think that you can take this card early and build around it. There are a decent number of token makers in the set, uh, and you can definitely prioritize them higher once you have Divine Visitation. Uh, a lot of the token makers make 1-1s, one and they're costed appropriately. So if you play Divine Visitation and then play 3 mana, make 2 one ones, then you are going to end up with 2 four, four Angels with Flying and Vigilance, and you're just going to win the game. So I think Divine Visitation is a card that if you can get it early, you can definitely build around it. Uh, next up, we have Flight of Equinox. Uh, this is a pretty strong Convoke card. Eight mana may seem like a lot, but when you're tapping your smaller creatures, your 1-1s to cast Flight of Equinox, getting a 4-5 flyer onto the battlefield on turn five, it's just a pretty big swing. Uh, if You can get it on turn five if you have like a reasonable curve, like two drop and then a three drop and four drop, then you can cast this on turn five. Um, or you can uh, play a card that makes two creatures for one, So, or you can play a one drop. There's multiple ways to get it out on turn five, and a four or five flyer is definitely huge. So I think Flight of Equinox is going to be a card that you want to prioritize early. You do want to play this if you have enough like good curve creatures, um, but some decks, if you don't have enough creatures, this card gets much worse. So you definitely need to make sure you have enough creatures. So I, I still think you can take it early and play it uh, in a lot of your decks, but you don't necessarily want to we're just running in any white deck because if you don't have the curve to support it, it's not going to be great. Next up, we have Gird for Battle. I don't hate this card because I can kind of see where they're going with it. Like if you have, I think permanent buffs for creatures are a little bit better in this set than they look because Mentor means that the creature can buff up your other creatures if you do that. So uh, I think you want Gird for Battle if you have Mentor creatures with Evasion. So uh, one of the uh, Mentor creatures that... Uh, I almost put it at the top five. I was like really debating it. Um, it it's a two three flyer. So if you put Gird for Battle on it, it immediately can buff up all of your two twos now, uh, which makes it a lot better. So I think Gird for Battle is going to be a type of card that you want if you have some mentor cards in your deck. Uh, but overall, I don't think it's going to be like the greatest of cards. I think a lot of the time you're not going to want it because putting one one counters on your creatures for a card is def is not worth it a lot of the time. Uh, next up, we have I don't, and also I don't think you need to prioritize Gird for Battle because most decks are not going to want it. I don't think uh, ha Hasna Marshall. Uh, is a 1-mana one 1-1. One -one. So already, 1-mana one 1-1s one are just pretty much unplayable and limited just because they don't impact the game enough, especially if you draw them after turn 1. Like, on turn 1, they might be fine, but if you draw them on turn 3, they're useless. Uh, this one has a decent ability. Uh, when you attack with, in, with 3 creatures, including Hasna Marshal, you get to create a 1-1 one -one soldier token with lifelink. So if you or if your opponent doesn't have a ton going on, or if you can curve 1-drop into 2 1-drops and then attack, uh, then Hasna Marshal can make you another creature that being said i don't really think this is great and limited because if you're attacking with three creatures including a one one and your one one's not dying then you're probably in fine shape anyway um the only time when i could see running a hasda marshal being okay is if you have enough convoke creatures or if you have en enough mentor creatures that are two drops that you want to have a one drop just so you can mentor it up uh that brings me next to my next card healer's hawk which basically fits a lot of the criteria hasda marshal fits i actually have healer's hawk as my number uh five white common 
And there was some competition. Uh, there were some other cards that I definitely could have included at number five. But I think Healer's Hawk has just enough going for it. And I think in the format specifically, it's going to be good. And normally when you see a 1-1 with lifelink and flying, people are going to love the card and it's not going to be very good just because um, one ones really need a lot of upside. But I think lifelink and flying makes it a little bit better because it's essentially hitting for two because you're gaining life and your opponent's losing life. So if you do play it on turn one, it's going to probably cause like a six point life swing if it hits them three times, which is pretty nice because it has, does have flying. And then I think with Mentor specifically, this card is going to be great because making it from a 1-1 one, one flying lifelink into a 2-2 two, two flying lifelink is huge because a 2-2 two, two flyer is kind of hard to deal with, uh, pretty hard to deal with. And the lifelink swing means that you're swinging four life every turn. And there's mentor creatures that are pretty cheap. So if you can like get this to be like a two, two flyer by turn like four or so, then you can like do good work. Like if we're talking about the, the marshal that we saw earlier, the blade instructor, you hit with this and you're one, one flyer on turn four. And all of a sudden it's, you've got a real threat, the two, two flyer that they have to deal with, or they get destroyed. So I think, and also it's a cheap card for convoke. So if you have a, one of those convoke creatures that really wants you to curve out, then you can maybe even cast it a turn earlier. Or if you have, uh, there's a couple of convoke creatures that cost like six to convoke. You can maybe cast those on turn four, turn turn five, like turn four, um, if you can get a healer's hawk and then another creature out. And even if one of your creatures dies, the healer's hawk I think is just going to be a card that you're going to want in this format. Lifelink and flying is a really nice combination, especially if your deck is a little bit aggressive. It also gains you life if you're not an aggressive deck. I just think healer's hawk is going to be a good card in this format. So I'm going to put it at the number five slot for common. Next up, we have Hunted Witness, another card that is pretty good, I think, because making a 1-1 one -one and then dying into another 1-1 one -one is kind of nice. It means that you can suicide it in with Mentor and like threaten them with a combat trick to blow them out. Or if you um, if, if it does attack in with Mentor, you get a creature back to block still. Uh, you can send it in on suicide attacks to get the... With, like If you're attacking with four or five creatures, they can like eat it, but you still get a 1-1 one -one back. Uh, it taps for Convoke. So I think... Hunted Witness is going to be playable in uh, a lot of decks, but def uh, I think it's going to be a step below Healer's Hawk because it doesn't have the evasion or the lifelink on its natural, like naturally have the lifelink. I think the key with the Healer's Hawk is it has lifelink and evasion. Hunted Witness, the 1-1 one -one token doesn't have evasion, so it's harder to get through with it. But I think, do think Hunted Witness could is definitely playable, especially if you're an aggressive deck that uh, would like to have some one drops to help you curve out, but it does only have one power, so it's not the most fearsome creature. Uh, inspire. Uh, you don't really need to prioritize it either. I don't. I don't think a lot. Like I, I think it's going to be like a medium, middle of the pack type pickup. You don't need to like take it like third pick to be able to get it. Uh, inspiring unicorn, I think, is a really nice card. Uh, there's a lot of card when it. It's like basically an anthem effect when it's attacking. It attacks as a three three. It gives your other creatures plus one plus one, uh, and the ability to uh buff your creatures is going to be really good because there are a lot a couple cards that make one ones or there are cards that are naturally one ones or kind of small so i think buffing your entire team is pretty nice uh it does work really well with combat tricks because your opponent is heavily incentivized to block the inspiring unicorn uh so i definitely think that i would take inspiring unicorn pretty early in a draft like maybe second or third pick potentially depending on my first pick uh and then after i have the inspiring unicorn i would take uh, combat tricks a little bit higher just because once you have the inspiring unicorn and you attack with it and you're buffing your whole team they're going to be incentivized to throw a double block on it and then if you give your inspiring unicorns like plus two plus two or plus three plus oh or i don't know exactly all the combat tricks off the top of my head but there's there's some things you can do to make it kill their, their creature and it stays alive and you get some value out of your combat tricks like that because they're very incentivized to block it so i think inspiring unicorn is going to be a good card and you want to take it early next up we have intrusive pack beast i have this as my number two white common i just see this card as ending a lot of games five mana three three vigilance is not a great body uh it's a little bit small but when you keep in mind that it taps two of their creatures it does start to get a little bit more scary um tapping two of their creatures is a really big swing in combat so if you're a t like casting your spells casting your spells you go two drop three drop maybe you miss your four drop or you use your removal spell on turn four and then you tap two of their blockers on turn five while developing your board with a three three which is not a un di disrespectful body then you can just do a lot of you can like swing in with your smaller creatures that were previously blanked it also makes it really hard for your opponent to turn the corner on you um you definitely don't want to be making suicide attacks if you have this card in your deck because if your opponent starts to attack you back they have to leave back three blockers if they want to ever have to a blocker in case of intrusive pack beast which they can't reasonably do so i can see this card ending a lot of games and i think you need to take it highly and you play like every copy you can get i think you would play like three copies of this at the top of your curve even though it is a five drop i think it's just that good it's really good in multiples too because they untap again they're trying to stabilize then you just tap the creatures again 
So, and it's a decent sized body itself. So <laughs> man, the flavor text is so good. Good at carrying things really good at knocking them down, man. I like it. I like it a lot, but I think a choose a pack beast is going to be great. And I think you need to be wary of this card. Like you have to end the game against the white deck in this format, just because if they have intrusive pack beast, you are going to lose to that card. Uh, next up, we have Ledev Guardian, an, another co a common Convoke creature. Uh, four mana for a 2-4, but it does have Convoke, so you can cast it for cheaper. So maybe if you get out a 1-drop uh, and then a 2-drop, then on turn 3, you could go 2-drop plus Ledev Guardian if you tap your other creatures, which is a pretty nice bargain. Uh, most of the time with Convoke, I think you're going to want to develop your creature instead of attacking for a couple points of damage. Um, obviously, it's very context-dependent, but I think Ledev Guardian is going to be fine. A 2-4 is not really insane, uh, but you... If it, if there was if it was a three mana two four it would be like fine uh, and if it's like a, if you cast it for two mana ever it's like decent but I don't think Lidev Guardian is gonna be a high priority I think you can play it like one or two copies but I think you can get it towards the end of a pack uh, it's definitely not one of the strongest Convoke creatures. Next up we have Light of the Legion. Uh, this is just a great rare. I mean six mana five five that has mentors pretty nice and then when it dies you put a plus one plus one counter on all your white creatures so like they can't really deal with it and like. It's a six mana five five, so it's going to kill them. It's going to buff all of your creatures while it's attacking. It can pretty much buff anything because it is a five five. So, I think Light of the Legion is really nice. Oh, also, um, Lidev Guardian does get a little bit better if you have uh, mentor creatures, just because two four becoming a three five is a pretty big gain. So, and two power means that it's you could potentially have creatures that you could use it to mentor or like that could mentor it. But yeah, Light of the Legion is a bomber. You take this first and play it every time. Any white deck pretty much wants this. Any any white deck wants this card. I'm not going to say pretty much even. It's just any white deck. Uh, Loxodon Restore is a much better Convoke payoff because it does cost a little bit more so you can get a little bit more for it. And you can ideally cast this on like turn three. Um, you go two drop, three drop. No, I mean one drop, two drop, three drop. And then cast this on turn four. Um, because it, you reduce the cost by three, and then, or you could just go two drop, three drop, and then make hit all your land drops and cast this. Um, but ideally, like if you wanted to attack with your three drop, you could go one drop, two drop, three drop, attack with your three drop, cast Locks on Restore on turn four. But Locks on Restore is nice. Uh, three, four bodies, a little bit bigger than the two, four before, and gaining four life can be relevant. I also think that it makes it a little bit better in control in more controlling decks because you can you don't you don't have to be as curve out because the four life makes it a better defensive option it's a three four which is a pretty defensive body so the, the four life i think is going to help you stabilize against aggro so if you're playing a more controlling deck with more convoke synergies you can uh, play loxodon restore i think it's definitely a little bit better uh than the two four uh obviously it depends on how good a three four is versus a two four but i think loxodon restore is going to be pretty good I don't think you need to prioritize it, though. I think it's just a mid-level card. You'll play it. You'll be fine with playing it. It's not going to be a card you're unhappy to play, but I don't think it's a card that you need to jump for joy playing. Uh, next up, we have Luminous Bonds. I think this is going to be the best white common. I mean, it was the best white common in... <laughs> in Ixl in uh, It was in uh, Rivals of Ixalan. It was the best white common in Rivals of Ixalan. It was the best white common in M19. It's just a very efficient card. Keep in mind, it doesn't stop activated abilities, so you can't shut down everything, but it shuts down pretty much everything for three mana, and it's at common, so it's just great removal. Um, Luminous Bonds is going to be an amazing card. There are a couple of cards that let you sacrifice in black, I think, but I think Luminous Bonds overall is just going to be great. So take this like very early. Like You first pick Luminous Bonds and are not unhappy about that a lot of the time. It's like one of the better commons overall. Luminous Bonds is going to be great. Um, it also goes well in any white deck controlling... Uh, aggressive, so Luminous Bonds is a uh, very good card. Take it early, play it every time. Parhelion Patrol was a card that I had a really tough time evaluating. I almost had it on my top five white commons, but I like ended up not. It just seems like it's in a really awkward place. Um, if it was a 3-2, it would be so much better in my opinion, just because Mentor on a two-power creature um, is not that great. Like, it doesn't really do much. And 4-mana 2-3 Flyer is like good. It's like fine, but not insane. Because Mentor is really much better the higher power the creature has. This was one of those cards that gets much better with the plus three, plus two aura. Because if you're attacking with your build your own five, five vigilance flyer dude uh, with mentor that's buffing your creature's mentor actually becomes relevant. But when you only have a two powered mentor creature, you're only buffing up one once. And by turn five, when Parhelion Patrol can finally attack, it's not buffing, like buffing up the creature doesn't really matter because they'll have a guy that can block the two, two ground creature, presumably. Um, that's why I like the 1-1, one, one, because it can't be blocked as easily later into the game when you're mentoring it up. But anyway, Parhelion Patrol, I don't think is going to be insane. I think it's going to be like a card that you play. I think it's going to be a mid-level pick, but I don't think it's going to be insane. And I think it's people are going to overvalue how good Parhelion Patrol is because they'll see Mentor, but Mentor doesn't really do as much on this card. Uh, Vigilance is really nice on this card. Two, three flyers with Vigilance um, are generally quite good. So I think this card is a card you will play. 
because you can attack and then you can hold back some things on defense. I mean, they're probably not going to have a great block on a 2-3 flyer all the time. So I do think this card's good. I just don't think it's one of the top five. I think you're going to take other things a little bit higher than it. Maybe depending on your deck, you'll take it over Healer's Hawk. I think those two are very close. Uh, but I don't think Parhelion Patrol is going to be as good as people think it is. And I do think that you want to be careful when playing Parhelion Patrol. Um, you want to make sure that your deck can use the all of the modes that it... Uh, like you want to make sure that your your deck doesn't care too much about the mentor, or you want to build your deck so that you can mentor small creatures with evasion, or you want to make be able to buff Parhelion Patrol's power. Um, even making it into a three four with the plus one plus one counter card is also much better. So I think Parhelion Patrol is going to be a card that you will take in like the middle of the pack. You'll play it a lot of the time. It does cost four mana, so you don't want too many of them, but I think it's a fine card. Righteous Blow is going to be very format dependent on whether it's good or not. If there's a lot of attacking, a lot of blocking, a lot of combat with small creatures, Righteous Blow is going to be much better. Um, but if you have, like, if it's more of a controlly format where two damage isn't as relevant and the getting into combat isn't how you win games, you win with grindy card advantage, Righteous Blow is not going to be as good. So I think I'm going to start off with Righteous Blow being, like, the type of card that you'll play one of in your main deck and then side more copies in. Uh, maybe you just play them only in the sideboard, if you depending on your deck, but I think you can definitely play a copy in the main deck early on in the format and not be too punished, um, but definitely be wary of this card because... It could really blow you out if you go for a combat trick early in the format. The two damage could definitely get you. Um, but yeah, I think this card's gonna it's gonna be really dependent upon the format. But I'm leaning towards it not being as good in this format because I think there's definitely some good controlling strategies. Um, especially Demir looks very strong to me. Um, next up we have Rock Charger. It's basically Pegasus Corsair. They finally figured out that that card is a dangerous common. I like how they changed it. Target attacking creature without flying gains flying. Um, I don't exactly know why they did that. Maybe for like bug reasons on MTG Arena, but I think that's kind of interesting. I think Rock Charge is going to be great. If it was a common, it'd be one of the top five commons easily. Um, it's just Pegasus Courser, and Pegasus Course is always good in aggressive decks. Even in non-aggressive decks, it's good. The one three body is a pretty decent blocker for, especially if they have flying attackers, and like it helps you turn the corner sometimes. But I think it's definitely much better in aggressive decks. But I think you take this card pretty early, uh, like first five, like first four picks of the draft, you'll be fine taking a Rock Charger and. You'll play that in all your aggressive decks, and it's really nice, especially with mentor creatures. Uh, it, mentor creatures make rock charger much better because they can buff up the rock, rock charger. Uh, so if you have a if you have a parhelion patrol, patrol, you can buff up the rock charger. So I think rock charger is going to be great. Uh, one power flying creatures with evasion, like one powered flyers that can buff the other guys are going to be great with mentor. So rock charger is a high pick, and you play it every time. Skyline Scout. I had this at number three, white common. I'm not exactly sure how good it's going to end up being. But I really like two two drops that have utility in the late game, and gaining flying is definitely a very like useful thing to get. I'm still not sure how great it's going to be, but I'm starting off pretty high on the card. Um, you need two, good two drops for any aggressive deck, and Skyline Scout is a two drop that's fine early, but it's like relevant late in the game. Uh, a lot of the time, you won't want to trade off your Skyline Scout because your intrusive pack beasts can help it connect later. The flying can help it connect later, so it has utility later in the game, whereas a lot of other two drops won't. So Keep that in mind if you're considering trading the Skyline Scout earlier on, but I think it's definitely going to be a good two drop. Uh, you can take it like medium high, like like fifth pick. Skyline Scout sounds about reasonable to me. I'm not exactly sure how much other decks are going to want this card. Uh, it does also tap for Convoke as an early play. Like that's why you really need to curve out in this format. So I think two drops are going to be premium. Uh, Sunhome Stalwart is another good card. First Strike makes it kind of hard to block, especially if you have some combat tricks. Uh, and then Mentor on a two two is not insane but it's still some nice upside. There's a couple of cards that make 1-1s. One it's like going Healer's Hawk into Sunhome Stalwart, the the one one that dies and makes a 1-1 one one into Sunhome Stalwart, you're making another 2-2. Two two. It's just a nice card, pretty hard to block early in the game. Pretty nice blocker itself, and so I just think Sunhome Stalwart's going to be a pretty good card. You'll take it pretty early, and then maybe even put a couple of cards that buff your creatures, like plus one, plus one counter card, or the maybe even the aura if you have Sunhome Stalwart, because giving this plus three, plus two in Vigilance uh, is just a beating if it doesn't die. So I think that's going to be a nice combo to be aware of. Sworn Companions, I put it the number four white common. I think there's enough Convoke synergies that's making two bodies for one card is going to be nice. It also works well with Mentor because the creatures do have lifelinks, so making a 1-1, one, one, even if you're suiciding it in, uh, it's a two-point life swing, and if you are able to connect with it, then you can make your 1-1 one, one into a 2-2, two, two, thanks to Mentor a lot of the time, and get in with a 2-2 two, two lifelinker. So I think because of Convoke and Mentor specifically, and the fact that it makes two bodies for one, so it's pretty good on defense. It can be it can make some chump blockers if you're trying to race in the air. I just think Sworn Companion is going to be a good card and one that you will want to take uh, prettier, like in the middle of the pack, um, but a card that, you're depending on your deck, you could take even sooner. Like if you have a couple of the like 
if you have a couple of really expensive convoke cards that are like massive creatures, you'll take sworn companions a lot higher because getting convoke cards out early is really nice and making two bodies for one card on turn three uh, is a really nice way of getting those cards out efficiently, especially if you miss your two drop and then you play sworn companions, it can still let you keep up and cast your cards on turn on time. So I have that at the number four white common. I have it a little bit over Healer's Hawk because I think it just it just does more as a card. Like if you're behind, Healer's Hawk is kind of bad, but Sworn Companions is still like pretty decent. Pretty decent. Uh, Take Heart is uh, the white combat trick. One mana, get creature gets plus two, plus two, and some added benefit. You gain one life for each attacking creature you control. So if you use it during combat, which it is a combat trick, that's when you would use it. Uh, you, like if you're attacking is ideally when you'd use it. So um, Take Heart does gain some value there. Um, uh, so I think plus two plus two for one mana is pretty expected white combat trick, but I think you definitely do want to prioritize this, especially if you have some mentor cards, because a lot of the time they'll want to really block your mentor creature so that your guy stops getting growing. So I think you'll definitely in an aggressive deck want to prioritize take heart and like take a couple of them. Like having three take hearts in an aggressive deck doesn't sound unreasonable to me. It actually sounds quite good. Uh, I'm a big fan of combat tricks in aggressive decks because when your opponent is forced to tap out to produce a blocker, you can really leverage take heart type effects because they don't have mana up to punish it with an instant speed removal spell or interaction of their own. So basically, take heart is going to be a one mana removal spell a lot of the time. You'll be able to play take heart and your other creature, um, and you can really get them. Especially, you can also kind of bait them too because you might make an attack that is kind of odd because you want to keep up creatures for convoke, and then take heart really gets them. It also makes it really hard for them to race you. Like if you attack with five creatures and they just block your biggest one then you take heart you gain five life uh, or even three creatures you gain three life kill their creature and then they can't really race you back like if you're there trying to race you in the air so i think take heart's going to be a great a good card in this format and one that you are going to want to have several copies of in your aggressive decks it obviously goes down in your defensive decks you don't gain life on defense um because it's attacking creatures you control so i think you definitely definitely want take heart more in uh aggressive decks than defensive decks if that's the one of the reasons combat tricks are worse in defensive decks is because when you have a defensive deck and you play a combat trick you are inherently um you're less likely to be able to like guarantee that your opponent's going to be tapped out when you use it so they can just blow you out a lot easier so that's something to be aware of next up we have uh, i think you can take this in the middle of the pack you prioritize it a little bit more if you don't have any combat tricks in your aggressive deck but pretty much middle of the pack later the end of the pack a lot of people don't want combat tricks in their deck so you're going to probably be able to get it uh 10th district guard is going to be fine i think it does sometimes enable attacks by giving your creature an extra toughness especially early in the game uh but overall it's just a two mana two two so nothing special just mid-level card definitely one that you that you'll be fine playing i think it does like i think in your aggressive decks especially if you have a couple of cards that have low toughness buff, bumping up the toughness by one could definitely help against certain decks so i think the ability is not irrelevant but it's not the greatest build ability in the world so i think it's going to be a fine fine playable and uh not something you'll want to play in your decks if it's just, especially because it's a two drop and two drops are going to be very premium just because of convoke and just curving out in aggressive decks our final white card is uh venerated loxodon uh this card is a beating you're pretty much always going to want to convoke it for four because five like <laughs> It's basically, if, if you have four creatures on the battlefield, it's a one mana 4-4 four, four that puts a counter on your entire board, which is just a beating. Um, it's a little bit reminiscent of this of a card, Ridge Scale Tusker, from, I think, Aether Revolt, and that card, you, you just lost the game every time your opponent casts that card. Um, Venerated Loxodon is going to be a card you take early, play it every time. Even if you're not a dedicated Convoke deck, if you're just a normal aggressive deck, buffing your entire team by plus one, plus one is great. It works wonderfully, like, just across the board it four four is a pretty big creature you can cast this early sometimes like you go one drop two drop cast this on turn three make your one one and two two bigger like there's a lot of flexibility a lot of power with venerated loxodon so i think you want to take it early and play it often but anyway that is going to do it for the white set review uh be sure to let me know what you think in the comments section down below uh and stay tuned for my set reviews on the other colors and uh on the multicolored artifacts and lands section as well but yeah, if you have any disagreements with cards I ranked, if you don't agree with my top five, be sure to let me know in the comments. I'm happy to discuss cards in more detail if you uh, would like. And overall, just uh, excited for Guild of Ravnica. If you have any cards that you think of cool combos or things like that, be sure to let me know. But I do just want to emphasize one last time, if you are drafting in this set or playing sealed, you do want to combine white with red or green because there's just so many powerful uncommons in those combinations that make you want to play. Boros, which is red-white, or Selesnya, which is green-white. So keep that in mind. 
when you're evaluating these cards, evaluate them in the context of green, white, or red, white, and you will do much better. But anyway, that is going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll talk to you next time.